like, should I take off the mask? Should I take it? Uh, so I did have con have. So uh, I first of all I would like to thank uh, Rosalia for the generous invitation. I'm, I'm deeply honored to be here and happy to present my work at Sea Junction. I think uh, Rosalia and her team uh, have been doing an impressive job here at Sea Junction, and I hope this is the beginning of a fruitful uh, cooperation. But I would like to thank team as well for, for being here uh, and, and for and for writing such a thoughtful, sensitive uh, review of my book. Uh, so thank you very much and, and thanks to all of you for, for coming today. So I, I have a PowerPoint presentation. I'm not sure how to uh, just yeah. oh that's perfect. Okay, so uh, we will uh, discuss about my book in detail, but I would like first to spend a few words on, on the research context, which is Bangkok, right? So uh, all of us uh, know very well that Bangkok is one of Southeast Asia's uh, most important uh, mega cities with a population of about 11 million inhabitants, which makes up approximately the percent of the country's whole population. It's uh, a regional force in finance and business. It's a top tourist destination, or at least it was so before the COVID pandemic uh, started. Uh, it's, a, it's an international hub for transport. Uh, and it's historically the Buddhist kingdom's uh, political, economic, and religious center. Now, uh, beginning with the 60s uh, up until the mid-90s, uh, Bangkok was one of the cities that registered the fastest economic growth in the world. Uh, and this were, these were years of, of tremendous transformation and infrastructural development for the city that transformed the capital from, from a panel-based settlement into uh, one of Southeast Asia's uh, most uh, important megalopolis. And now Bangkok is a city of skyscrapers, is a city of business, is a city of tourists, but it's also a city of the poor. Uh, during those years, uh, as it always happens, during these uh, seasons of crazy and uncontrolled hyper-developmentalism, uh, socioeconomic inequalities uh, grew uh, both within the city and between the city and the rest of the country. Uh, already in the 60s, peasants from Thailand's uh, rural and ethnic minority regions, especially the north and the northeast of Thailand, began migrating to the capital in, sor in search of job opportunities in, in the context of the ever-expanding economy of the big city. And for many of these firmer peasants, uh, migration to the city was the only chance of survival uh, in a country where the, the urban rural gap remains very problematic, both economically and, and politically. Uh, now, many of these peasants became uh, slum dwellers, right? Uh, they were certainly unable to afford uh, housing costs in Bangkok, and, 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 and slums became the solution for me. Now, according to official statistics that are very often approximated by default, there are about slums in Bangkok, uh, which makes, makes up approximately 2 million individuals, right? Uh, the 20% of the total population of, of the inner core of the city. Now, the protagonists of my book are children who were Here, as Rosalia mentioned, an ethnographic study of children living in slum areas, but it's also a study of children's everyday lives in Thai schools, in Buddhist temples and foundations, in Christian charities, in international and national and geo venues, 
and in social media. Mm. So this book explores the daily lives, constraints, aspirations of children who were born in the slums of Bangkok, but also their ways of defining themselves and their place in Thai society as they relate with a number of institutions that are supposedly in charge of addressing the childhood marginality in Bangkok's uh, poorest districts. So uh, my book uh, describes what it means to grow up as a slum child in Bangkok. But more broadly, uh, it also illuminates what I call the cultural politics of childhood in contemporary Thailand. Now, for cultural politics, I refer to uh, the multiple agendas, institutional positions, and, and, and policies that are relevant to childhood uh, at the margins of Bangkok society. Let me be uh, clear on, on, on this particular point. Uh, we all know that uh, children's innate capacities and capabilities hold the prospects of a list of possibilities for personal development, right? But this is steered, even constrained, by the social, political, and economic context in which a child is born and the socialization paths that are largely conditioned and constrained by economic, religious, and political They are considered not yet complete subjects that need to be socialized, educated, and taught morality in order to ensure the continuity of what is supposed to be a normal or desirable uh, social, political, and economic order. So children's minds and children's bodies are constantly at the center of public debates about issues such as ethnic purity, national identity, and the transmission of fundamental cultural values in schools. These debates are particularly contested when they address children that are considered abnormal or deviant from what is supposedly a good or normal child. Now, this precisely the case of children living in Bangkok's slum areas as uh, descendants of migrants from Thailand's northern and northeastern regions, uh, these children are considered as distant from the pure Thai child. They are very often considered unpolite, dirty, dangerous, uh, unrespectful towards authority and therefore they are targeted by the Thai state's militarized pedagogy with a particular emphasis. Now, my book shows, though, that the Thai state is not the only institution involved in these children's lives. Not any longer, because beginning with the 70s, with the emergence of a transnational discourse which is focused on children's rights, Islam communities in Bangkok are increasingly populated by agencies other than the state, religious organizations, children's rights, NGOs, local, international, etc. And what these children may encounter in these contexts can be different from what they encounter, say, in Thai state schools. And this has profound political implications insofar as these alternative educational projects can challenge the Thai state's attempt to turn poor kids into good children and loyal citizens. Uh, the globalization of children's rights in Thailand, I think, has been insufficiently scrutinized, and I guess, I argue, it, it, it has important 
connections with structural change in other social and political spheres. Now, one of the key questions my book is built on is then, how does a good or normal childhood look like in Thailand? And why do poor children, why are poor children considered dangerously distant from the pure ideal Thai child? Consider this picture. Uh, do you have any idea what this picture is about? Any thought about what this picture represents? Now, this picture is a representation of one day, uh, the International Day for the Promotion of Children's Rights, which is the local version of Universal Children's Day. Uh, this is celebrated in Thailand in the second week of January and this day in various government offices, including major military installations, are open to children and their families. Now, uh, on one day uh, in 2014, I went to the Bangkok headquarters of the Royal Thai Army's military forces in, on Chiang Matana Road. Uh, where celebrations uh, and activities uh, were taking place. Uh, and they went there to examine how the public characterization of the good Thai child was being staged. Now, during this day, soldiers, as the picture suggests, uh, showed uh, children the best pieces of the Thai military uh, arsenal, helicopters, tanks, uh, weapons of war of various kind. And you can imagine how this was a thrilling event for the kids. Uh, the event emphasized that a good Thai child, a D in Thai, uh, needs to be a purely Thai child that is honoring the monarchy, Buddhism, and the nation. And this is something that the children were almost obsessively told, uh, even at school, during their everyday lessons. Now, uh, to be a good child, to be a big B in the Thai context, in that particular context, meant to emulate the example of soldiers, of Thai soldiers, who were portrayed as the nation's brave and generous they to sacrifice themselves for the good of Thainess, Pampin Thai, the Thai national identity. Now, uh, even during the day that is formally dedicated to the celebration of children's rights, children were instructed to always obey and respect Puyai, the good, the, the adults. Uh, now, the Children's Rights Day was recommended worldwide by the United Nations in 1954, and is officially aimed at promoting children's rights, including the right for children to have their views heard in the context of a horizontal relationship and to be protected from violence. Now, given this, consider that Thailand ratified the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child in 1992. Now, given this, it was curious, to use an euphemism, uh, that uh, children were exposed to weapons of war, which is the quintessential technological materialization of violence the event used the weapons of war as a form of pedagogy and entertainment with the aim of solidifying rather than undoing hierarchy. Now, what came through at the Children's Day celebration is a tension, is a contradiction that animates much of my book, much of my study. That is, 
there is a clear contradiction between two different cultural and political conceptualizations of childhood. On the one hand, there's the juridical definition of the child that is proposed by United Nations agencies in Geneva, and that is very often only formally acknowledged across the world. And on the other hand, there's the local militarized portrait of the good Thai child, who is uh, an obedient child, subordinate to both adults and the will of the nation itself. Right? Now, uh, Islam children are very often considered the class ethno-linguistic and moral nemesis of the good Thai child. They are constructed as the opposite of the good Thai child. And in my book, I show how the children are very aware of this, but they are also very aware of the new discourses about childhood that the globalization of children's rights has brought to Thailand. And they are able to play with this tension in order to achieve their personal goals. I'm going to show you another picture here, which I took during my field work, which I think is a good visual representation of children in the slum. Uh, in the picture on, on the right side of the screen, there's a writing, the red spray, which say, Rawande Da, attention, children bite. And this is something that the children draw themselves as to mark a space that they felt like as they owned. Rosalie is giving me signals because I will need to shut up very soon. Uh, so, um, as we only have five minutes left, I will show you a few pictures that I think provide visual cues of the different notions and conceptualizations of childhood that the children I worked with encountered in the various social settings that form their everyday lives. This is cool. And this is uh, a Thai traditional salutation training in the primary uh, school kids, right? I think this is pretty eloquent and doesn't need to be commented upon. Now, besides schools, uh, poor children very often benefit from the support of Buddhist uh, foundations and NGOs. And in this context, their status and their poverty can be conceptualized in very different ways from what we observed in the context of high schools or in the context of the Children's Day celebrations in Bangkok. Christian charities. Uh, I would say that uh, Christian charities activism in Thailand's humanitarian context is very often unnoticed. And yet, they are very present in this children's life. This is a reproduction of Charity, where some of the kids they worked with were posted. So this is childhood in, in the slum. And this is a picture uh, demonstrated, demonstrated uh, childhood's independence in the slums of Bangkok. Very often children are infantilized in the context of Western NGOs or children's rights organizations. Right? There's the issue of the cultural misinterpretation of local childhood. Very often Western agencies tend to project their own ideologies into other cultural contexts, which is a 
uh, very problematic uh, effect of the activism. And in the slum, I discovered that children were actually the people I needed to follow in order to survive myself in that context. They were the adults while I was the child. Uh, so I actually experienced a quite interesting inversion of roles that uh, speaks volume, volumes about how different childhoods are at stake uh, in this kid's life. Uh, this, these are images again taken in the slums of Bangkok. Uh, the slums of Bangkok uh, in, in recent, in traditional literature are described as closed communities of rural to urban migrants, as kind of urban villagers, right? Well, what I, what I discovered, what I found in the slums of Bangkok is actually that today slums are cosmopolitan, international, arenas of child development and of child-focused humanitarianism. Children in the slum would meet missionaries, monks, white researchers, Western volunteers, so they are really exposed to a variety of cultural influences that make them pretty uh, aware of the cultural diversity that makes up our world today. Sometimes even more aware of this than upper middle class kids, I would say. Uh, this picture, uh, I put it here because some of the kids I worked with are now youths. Are some, unsurprisingly, these youths are now joining the youth movement that is shaking Thailand's political landscape. And this is me. Uh, ten years ago, I had long hair, and uh, it was uh, a wonderful time, actually, of my life with these kids. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. And sorry that I had to uh, signal the time, but we want to have enough time for uh, the commentator to give her view on the book and then for the public really to ask. I think all the photographs already give of uh, the various uh, dimensions of the book. So there are many dimensions in this book, as we can see also in the last photograph of the current event of how they have grown up and are now part of the struggle about defining citizenship and other uh, national identities. So please, Pim, uh, so as I said before, Pim is a writer, please. And uh, she has written a review on this book uh, and she can now tell us more what she thinks about it. Hi, um, my name is Pim, Pim Wang Bae Chowan. Um, I'm a writer, so I spent the last couple of years mostly writing articles, um, cultural articles on Thai culture and also cinema. And um, I have a debut novel coming out next year. And um, I've been writing, writing for... Uh, close, the, close the microphone, it's too open. Yeah. And um, I've been writing for a publication called the Macomb Review for I think about six, six years now. And I was chosen to write a, a review of this book because um, I grew up um, in a Christian church in the Kwangta Islam in um, a community called Desit Rai. So since I was very young, I grew up alongside children from the slums. Um, teaching them music, teaching them art, teaching them English, and also um, becoming friends and sort of family with them. So they, till this day, they are my friends and also my siblings. I consider them my siblings. So when I was asked to write this review, at first I was skeptical because there are many, uh, sometimes there are many um, either missionaries or Western 
volunteers who come into Thailand, who come into Bangkok, who come into the slums um, with the aim of helping these children, but sometimes they don't particularly understand the dynamic of the children or of the families in the slum, and they have a very, maybe, very surface level perception of what's going on. But when I read this book, I was very um, impressed. I think I told you this just outside right now, just then, that I was very impressed with the nuance of the book. It's very complex, and there are so many things that when I read um, the book that reminded me of the children that I grew up with, and it reminded me of the families that I've known over the years. And also being Thai myself, and growing up in Thailand, and going to a Thai school, it really gave me the time to reflect back on my education, or how I was brought up. So um, sometimes when you're in something, or when you're part of something, you don't quite realize the full extent until you're it from the, an outsider's perspective. And one of the things I really um, find really interesting about the book is, I think you mentioned this a little bit in, in your presentation, is the terms of militarization of children and how that's instilled, even um, in just uh, children who are from the slums, just normal everyday Thai children. It made me reflect on my experiences from school, for example, how every morning we would have to stand in line and sing the national anthem, how every um, Friday evening we would have to sing the King's Anthem, and um, how, for example, in my school, um, the director of the school was seen as a kind of like a king-like figure, figure in a way. We would have to crawl on our knees to address him, and so it really made me reflect back on how children in Thailand have been brought up or taught to like you said, um, Shah nation, king, and religion. And, um, and also when it, um, another thing that I really admire about the book is, you said like the protagonists of your books are Because I know the children as a Thai person and quite, I'm quite close to them, I can see how sometimes these children or these families view Westerners who come in and it's totally different to what the Westerners view themselves or view the children. I find that most of the time there's a stereotype of how outsiders look into the slums and I think you've seen all of these the pictures, for example, if you see photographs of outsiders coming into the slums and they will take all these like photographs of children like <laughs> looking miserable <laughs> and um, and stuff like that. And um, when I was writing this review for this book, I um, interviewed many of the kids that I grew up with and I asked them what their childhood was like and what they the image that they painted for me is so different to the typical perception of what a slum childhood is. So when you think the stereotype is you know, drugs, broken families, and these things exist, but these children would talk about how they would just enjoy spending time with friends, or how, fun, or how much fun they had um, growing up with so many people, or it, it, it would just sound like a normal, like a normal, quote unquote, normal childhood. And what I really appreciate is that the book, again, <laughs> really shows how it's a very nuanced, nuanced portrayal of how um, the children view the volunteers who come in and out. And it gives the children agency in a way that most. Um, maybe most portrayals of them don't, if that makes sense. <laughs> so that's something that I find uh, very commendable about the book. And um, sorry, I have my twelve talking points written down so I don't forget them. And um, when it comes to, there's a lot of um, exploration of 
Christian NGOs or religious organizations in the book. And there's a one particular chapter about how children, some children do find a sense of belonging or a sense of maybe family with these charities or these NGOs. But there are also some families or some children who um, not like take advantage of Zorawa, but they they see that this being a part of these charities or being a part of these NGOs can actually benefit them in financial ways. And it really made me think about the work that the church that I grew up in did in the slums. And it really made me question, oh, are we actually, how much of a difference are we actually making? Are the kids, what do the kids get from these activities, do they get anything? Do they? So these are the questions that I also asked the children that I interviewed for the review. And one of the things that really stuck with me was that they said that the things that really help, sometimes, they said that sometimes getting financial aid is helpful, but what has really stayed with them? Uh, they really do remember things like Japanese volunteers who come in to help them do like arts and crafts or the library in the slums that they could come in and just read or spend time together as friends and lots of them speak a lot about finding a way to empower the children finding a way to help children in the slums express themselves or explore their creativity and um one of the kids i interviewed is um, um he's studying to become a nurse right now and he's he talked to me about how um, most of the parents in the slums maybe would just encourage their children to pursue paths that they see are quite financial. A soldier, like it's like, like um, you mentioned about the nation, <laughs> um, monarchy, and um, religion, and so the kids said that he really. book does that and um, I hope we can find maybe even better way for they, their voices to be the main, the central voices in discussions about their lives going forward. That was, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Before we open the floor, actually there is someone uh, who has helped with the research uh, introducing Giuseppe to many NGOs and organizations and she would like to also say a few words about unfortunately or fortunately for her, she is in Chiang Mai, so she will be talking uh, from Chiang Mai. <laughs> So now it's fine. Hello? Can you hear us? Let's see if we if it works. Can you hear us? Okay, so please uh, tell us more about Giuseppe and his book, All the Secrets. ก็วันนี้ก็จะมาเล่าแบ่งปันประสบการณ์นะคะในการที่จะเป็นได้เป็นผู้ช่วยวิจัยให้กับคุณจูเซเป้นะคะว่ากว่าจะมาได้เป็
อยากจะเล่าหาว่าเราได้เข้ามาช่วยมาเป็นผู้ช่วยวิจัยของคุณจูซิเต้ได้ยังไง So she want to tell um, about her research. <laughs> so she want to tell how she engaged in the research, how she helped in, and she say congratulations for your book publishing that publishing worldwide. And um, yeah, she want to share some experience during her time. ค่ะวันนี้ไม่ได้ยินเสียงฝั่งนู้นเนาะค่ะก็เดี๋ยวจะหยุดให้เป็นช่วงช่วงนะคะก็ปกติพวกเราเรียกกันจุดเซตเต้นะคะอยากจะเล่าก่อนว่าตอนที่เจอการรู้จักกันนะคะเป็นยังไงบ้างก็คุณโจเซฟเป้อะค่ะปกติเราจะไม่เรียกจุดเซฟเป้เราไปเรียกญาตินะคะเราจะเรียกโจเซฟแล้วก็น้องๆทุกคนเนี่ยที่ที่รู้จักโจเซฟนะคะเราจะเรียกพี่โจเซฟพี่โจเซฟนะคะซึ่งตอนนั้นลุงกับโจเซฟเนี่ยเราได้รู้จักกันครั้งแรกตั้งแต่ปีพศ2012นะคะคือจนถึงปัจจุบันเนี่ยก็9ปีที่ผ่านมาเลยนะคะตอนนั้นเนี่ยโจเซฟเขาได้มาเออแนะนําตัวเองค่ะว่าเข้ามาในประเทศไทยอะไรอย่างเงี้ยค่ะโทรมาหาลุงโดยผู้ภาษาไทยนะคะคือเป็นความโชคดีค่ะที่ความสามารถของเขาเนี่ยพูดภาษาไทยได้เก่งคือถ้าเขาพูดภาษาไทยไม่ได้นะคะการช่วยเหลือของเราเนี่ยมันเป็นไปได้ยากนะคะอันนี้ต้องชื่นชมเขาจริงๆแล้วก็เขาขอให้ลุงอะค่ะช่วยพาไปเกี่ยวกับงานวิจัยไปติดต่อหน่วยงานหรือองค์กรต่างๆที่เกี่ยวข้องกับเด็กๆในช่วงนั้นนะคะซึ่งตอนนั้นเราก็ยังไม่ค่อยแน่ใจว่าเอ๊ะโจเซฟได้เปิดลุ่งมาได้ยังไงตอนหลังเราก็รู้ว่าอ๋อทางชุมชนของบางซื่อนะคะที่เขาลงไปศึกษาเนี่ยเขาเป็นคนที่เอ่อให้เปิดติดต่อลงมาเพราะตอนนั้นเนี่ยเราเรียนเอ่อปริญญาโทค่ะเก็บข้อมูลที่ชุมชนบางซื่อพอดีก็เลยเป็นโอกาสที่ทําให้เราได้รู้จักกันในช่วงนั้นนะคะก็ก็อ่าคุณคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ๋อคุณอ
จอเซฟเมทอดโลจีหรือการเก็บข้อมูลของเขาค่ะคือเขาไม่ใช้ชีวิตกับเด็กๆค่ะในชีวิตประจําวันของเด็กๆเลยแบบอินฟอร์มอลค่ะแบบไม่เป็นทางการแล้วก็เป็นธรรมชาติแล้วบอกวิธีมันวิจัยอะไรเนี่ยอะไรอย่างเงี้ยค่ะเราไม่เคยเห็นแล้วก็เราก็แบบด้วยความที่เขาทำความที่เขาไปเก็บต้องไปเก็บกับเด็กๆไปอยู่กับเด็กๆแล้วก็เออพยายามที่จะศึกษาเรียนรู้จากโจเซฟถึงวิธีวิจัยแบบนี้ค่ะแบบลงไปฝังตัวลงเอาตัวเองไปมีส่วนร่วมอย่างเงี้ยค่ะซึ่งโจเซฟบอกว่าเขาก็ได้ไปแนะนําตัวบอกความจริงไม่ได้ซ่อนตัวกับเด็กๆเลยค่ะบอกว่าถูกผสมบอกที่มาที่ไปว่าเขาเป็นใครมาทําอะไรให้กับเด็กๆซึ่งเด็กๆดีใจมากนะคะที่มีฝรั่งนะคะเข้าไปอยู่กับเขาเข้าไปคุยกับเขาเราพูดภาษาไทยได้ด้วยมันมันกลายเป็นการแบบการศึกษาวิจัยที่มีชีวิตชีวาค่ะมันไม่ใช่หน้าบื่ออะไรอย่างเงี้ยค่ะค่ะ so um I first thought that it's gonna be like few days research but actually no it's last very long and um his his methodology is is very informal it's actually typical to live with the children and use their ethnography there's no graphic methodology so it's actually going to be So in the past we have the children, the community is making a sort of safe playground. What is what his preference was? He is and the children are very happy. Yes, yes. All around there, and then go to go to the playground. Yeah. 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 ไปไปแบบพาโจเซฟไปเจอเด็กๆนะคะตามที่พวกบอกว่าเอออยากได้เจอน้องกลุ่มนี้กลุ่มนั้นอย่างเงี้ยค่ะกลุ่มแรกเลยที่ที่ที่ลุ่งพาโจเซฟไปมันก็เป็นกลุ่มน้องเเด็กและเยาวชนนะคะที่อาศัยเใช้ชีวิตในในวัดสุนแก้วที่จังหวัดนนทบุรีนะคะซึ่งโจเซฟก็ไปอยู่กับกับน้องๆนะคะไปกินไปนอนไปอยู่กับน้องๆเนี่ยอยู่ที่นั่นที่สลายวันเหมือนกันนะคะทีนี้เออต้องขออนุญาตให้ทำเลยนะคะว่าเอออยู่จนขี้แตกอะค่ะต้องส่งโรงพยาบาลดีอะไรอย่างเงี้ยค่ะนะคะเพราะฉะนั้นต้องต้องบอกว่าการวิจัยของเขาเนี่ยมันเป็นสิ่งที่เขาแบบพาไปว่าวิจัยคือชีวิตเลยค่ะชีวิตของเขาเลยเขาทําไปแบบอยากจะอยู่กับเด็กๆอยากจะเข้าใจเด็กๆจริงๆเนี่ยแต่เราก็เป็นห่วงเนาะด้วยความต่างชาติที่จะต้องไปกินอยู่กับกับอาหารของเด็กๆที่นั่นนะคะแล้วก็เป็นยุโรปมาทิ้งอาหารนะคะแล้วก็เขากลับมาค่ะก็จะเล่าเล่าให้ฟังนะคะว่าเออเด็กๆอ่ะมีชีวิตอย่างไรเจอเหตุการณ์อย่างไรบ้างทีเรานั่งร้องไห้ด้วยกันเนาะเพราะว่าเรายอมรับเลยว่าเราอยู่ประเทศไทยเนี่ยเราไม่เคยรู้เลยว่าชีวิตของน้องๆเนี่ยลำบากขนาดนี้นะคะน้องน้องวันน้องยังต้องต่อสู้เลยนะคะเกิดมาเนี่ยบางคนไม่มีพ่อไม่มีแม่นี่โจเซฟเนี่ยลืมงานวิจัยไปเลยบางทีบอกว่าเฮ้ยเราช่วยกันดีกว่าไหมน้องบางคนไม่มีบัตรเราก็พาไปอย่างเต็มที่ค่ะไปช่วยน้องจนจนกระทั่งน้องมีบัตรนะคะอันนี้ก็คือถือว่าเราเราดีใจที่เขามาทําวิจัยเนี้ยแล้วเราได้มีส่วนหนึ่งไปไปช่วยเด็กๆเหล่านี้ค่ะ so um the the first thing that I have to do is to to call one or two and spend many days with the children ค่ะคือนอกจากที่จะพาโจเซฟไปเก็บข้อมูลกับเด็กๆไปใช้ชีวิตกับเด็กๆตามที่ที่เขาบอกเรานะคะว่าอยากจะไปสถานที่รู้สถานที่นี้เนี่ยนอกจากนี้ลุงก็ได้มีโอกาสพาเข้าไปค่ะสัมภาษณ์เป็นการอินทรีย์ผู้คุยกับคนที่ทํางานด้านเด็กนะคะที่อยู่ที่เป็นองค์กรที่อยู่ในชุมชนแออัดของเตยค่ะซึ่งอันนั้นก็สบายมากเพราะว่าเราทํางานในเครือข่าที่ทําเกี่ยวกับช่วยเหลือเด็กส่งต่อเคสเนี่ยเราก็เลยพาแนะพาเขาไปแนะนําเจ้าหน้าที่ต่างๆซึ่งเป็นเจ้าหน้าที่ที่เป็นเจ้าหน้าที่ช่วยเหลือเด็กเป็นครูของเด็กข้ามถนนเนี่ยค่ะในหลายๆองค์กรเราก็รวมไปถึงเราพาไปสัมภาษณ์กับพระสงฆ์ที่เป็นนักพัฒนาเด็กในชุมชนคลองเตยด้วยนะคะซึ่งตัวโจเซฟเองเขาจะใช้เรื่องของการสังเกตด้วยนะคะเวลาที่เขาลงไปสัมภาษณ์มีการออบเซอร์ดูความเป็นอยู่ของเด็กๆที่ที่อยู่ในชุมชนแพร่อัดคลองเตยเนี่ยค่ะแล้วก็สิ่งที่เขา
ได้เก็บข้อมูลมาเนี่ยมันอยู่ในเรื่องของหนังสือที่เขาบันทึกไว้ในเรื่องของในเรื่องของวิจัยนะคะในบิลเกอร์สติเซนซึ่งถ้าใครได้อ่านเนี่ยมันจะได้ฉายภาพแบบเสมือนจริงเลยค่ะเป็นวัวชั่วจริงๆที่จะสะท้อนภาพของความเป็นเด็กในในสังคมไทยได้อย่างชัดเจนซึ่งตัวลูกเองเนี่ยอ่านของเขาแล้วก็เอาเราก็เป็นเด็กที่เขาเขียนแบบนั้นเหมือนกันก็ทําให้เรามองเห็นตัวเองในในความเป็นเด็กในสมัยนี้ได้ได้ชัดเจนมากขึ้นค่ะคุณลุงเดี๋ยวขอมาทำหน้าที่ทำหน้าที่ค่ะ so she said that that um on his book so ช่วงเรียนรู้ช่วงเรียนรู้เรื่องทุกอย่างที่เราทำได้ดีมากและเราทำได้ดีมากและเราทำได้ดีมากและเราทำได้ดีมากและเราทำได้ดีมากและเราทำได้ดีมากและเราทำได้ดีมากและเราทำได้ดีมากและเราทำได้ดีมากและเราทำได้ดีมากและเราทำได้ดีมากและเราทำได้ดีมากและเราทำได้ดีมากและเราทำได้ดีมากและเราทำได้ดีมากและเราทำได้ดีมากและเราทำได้ดีมากและเราทำได้ดีมากและเราทำได้ดีมากและ ตอนจากเดือนสิบเอ็ดและทั้งหมดของเราทั้งหมดของเราทั้งหมดของเราทั้งหมดของเราทั้งหมดของเราทั้งหมดของเราทั้งหมดของเราทั้งหมดของเรา
um, or the families, and how you got consent from families, from children, and also um, other words slipping my mind, but knowing consent from the children you were working with. Very good question. And the last question, if any. Okay, please. Hi, I'm Emily, and from Philippines, but well, I've been here in Thailand for quite a year. Um, I was just like, it struck me when you said that uh, there are, there were those people who grown up and they just remember how happy they were when they were. Because um, I'm from Philippines, and most children from from our slum areas who are as young as they are, and they don't enjoy being a child as far as I know. So my question is, are these children being sent also to work by their parents? Are their children being sent to work to earn, to help the family? Okay, maybe I have the last question uh, since before. <laughs> it seems you have a lot of dimension, political, cultural, etc. But what about the economy? dimension of this all. There seems not to be too much, and I have not read the book yet, forgive me for that, not much about the political economy of the slum uh, compounds, so to say. Please, and then we will do another round. So I will start from this uh, last question, because it's easier to remember it. Uh, <laughs> So the political economy of uh, Salam uh, communities, there's quite a lot to talk about this. Well, slums are the main source of informal economy within uh, the capital. And we know very well that informal economy constitutes roughly the 40 to 50, say, percent of the economic infrastructure of the capital without the informal economy the capital would collapse. Um, but in my book, I also describe what I call the moral economy of childhood. And for moral economy of childhood, I refer to the humanitarian enterprise itself. Because helping slum kids can be a business. And uh, it can be a business of many parties would take advantage from. So the construction of Islam children as poor victims, this is something that also been uh, touched up before. Very often Islam children are described either as victims or as social dangers, right? And actually by living with them, uh, I discovered that they are neither victims nor social dangers. They are very often quite normal kids, right? But there's the need to portray them as victims because this representation legitimizes uh, humanitarian intervention on them. So the construction of children's victimhood is actually a a, an economic commodity because uh, it elicits compassion, it uh, prompts donors fund these activities, and it keeps the enterprise working. And the children themselves take advantage of this. So uh, helping children is bad strategy, market, business, and they describe this as a moral economy. And I think that this particular economic dimension of uh, the urban poor in Bangkok has not been sufficiently scrutinized yet. Everyone knows that uh, Islam communities are a source of informal economy, for example, but this particular infrastructure. And that's the reason why many Islam dwellers do not want to leave the slums. I know many families who would have the opportunity to leave the slums, but they don't do this because leaving the slums would mean for them to lose the support, the financial support of NGOs and to lose the NGO network they are embedded in. So that's, that's uh, a very uh, superficial, if you want, question, but there's much more to go from this. Uh, are the children sent off uh, for work? 
So uh, it depends. All the children I was in touch with go to school, actually. And, and many of the families I worked with uh, do enormous sacrifices for the kids to be able to get educated. I have to say I'm particularly impressed by the role of women in the slums. Uh, slums are largely matrifocal communities. Families are very often made up of grandmothers, mothers, and a large number of kids, whether biologically related to, to that kin group or not, because there are a lot of adopted children as well, foster children that are incorporated into these families. Men uh, are often described as unreliant providers. They spend the money with friends, uh, gambling, alcohol consumption, and they have to say this is not only a stereotype very often. And there are economic reasons for this as well, because uh, at least uh, at the very beginning of Islam proliferation in Bangkok, uh, families migrated to Bangkok were rural families. Now, in rural context, men would be controlled by the extended family network. But when they migrate to the slum, uh, very often men can get jobs outside of the slum, but women wouldn't, especially if they are mothers, because no one would give jobs to pregnant women or to young, unskilled, and uneducated mothers. Then. So very often, the women stay in the slum and use the slum as a source of economic uh, production and reproduction, whereas men are able to get off from the slum and their return. And this um, freedom they, they, they get in the context of the big city can be very often used in uh, negative ways, let's say. Uh, so that's uh, my answer. So if you were referring to child labor, I didn't see any uh, particular form of children's exploitation in slums. Slums, again, are demonized as places of drug trafficking, prostitution, violence, etc. But actually, I was um, adopted by a Thai family when I was living in the slum, and I found one of the most uh, warm and, and, and intimate environment I could have found, found in my life in that context. So I would say very often these representations are misrepresentations. Uh, and these misrepresentations again serve, uh, serve to legitimize the government uh, attitude towards the urban poor and their stigmatizing views as well. Uh, ethical dimensions of the research process. This is indeed a very important question. How did they choose the children? How did they choose that particular slum? Well, before becoming an anthropologist, I'm an anthropologist. In my, in my former life, I was actually a clinical psychologist. And I was working myself with a humanitarian organization called Psychologists Without Borders. They sent me off to Thailand for the very first time in 2008 was not my choice. I was assigned to this particular community. And not the Italian middle class kids I was used to work with. And the fact that many Western organizations have this ethnocentric, we say in anthropology, uh, preconceptions, but I, this is something that made me mad. So when I got back to Italy, I quit from my job as a psychologist, and I decided to start PhD in anthropology, because the PhD in anthropology would allow me to spend a long time and that was the only way for me to try to be helpful, right? So when I got back as a PhD student in anthropology, I got back to the same community 
the same kids. I already lived with as a volunteer in my capacity as a psychology program. The ethical review process, well, I follow uh, ethnographic principles in validating ethics, which means that I ask myself, what is it ethical for them? Very often, uh, child protection protocols uh, enforce ethical procedures on other populations. Ethical procedures that are Eurocentric in their own development and conception. And this, paradoxically, becomes unethical because if you provide kids in the slum or uneducated, unable to be the right mothers in the slums with forms and ask them to sign them, you would be a very uh, strange relational situation that would provoke uh, distrust. And so, so what they did was to first try to understand how do they express their consent locally? How do, and, and then I realized that verbal consent was the way to go, and it was important for me to speak, of course, in Thai, so I spent quite uh, a lot of time to develop my Thai language skills in order to make sure that consent was uh, explicitly expressed. Uh, Muslim NGOs, I didn't bump into Muslim NGOs, uh, but this doesn't mean that Muslim NGOs are not involved in the moral economy of childhood in Thailand, and I, I bet this is particularly the case in the south of Thailand. But all the families I worked with, and particular communities I was working with, um, was a Buddhist, primarily Buddhist community, and Muslim NGOs were not there. Whereas Christian organizations, yes, they were there. I would like to um, address the last question um, about whether many families sent their children off to do um, to work. And from my experience, from the families that I know and from the children that I know, not when they were children. So when they were children, most of them would go to school, and the walking would start when after they graduated from school. And um, um, when you said um, when you asked about. Um, my the kids that I interviewed and their re recollection of their childhood. Um, of course, with um, their childhood, there were tough moments and things that were that they struggled with. But when um, when I interviewed them to ask them to relay their childhood, most of what they said is overwhelmingly positive. And I brought that up just to um, to um, carry on from your point is that. There's an overwhelming stereotype that children from the slums are victims, or they are they have no agency, and bad things bad things just sort of happen to them. And um, I, from what they've said and from what what I observed, they have a lot of agency, and I, and they their childhood, despite their struggles, they still find a lot of joy and happiness from their childhood years. I do think that from knowing them, things I think they struggle more when they um, get to maybe like teenage years or they later like teen years, especially when they have to go out and find jobs or move away from school. And I think one, it's, I don't, well, with, not with most Thai families. Thai, Thai families, families don't don't really like send children off to work in that kind of way. But there's one um, term that we hear a lot, and that's the word "kwam katanyukatawiti," and which means indebtedness. So that's the that's the word that the children that I spoke to bring up a lot. When Okay, we open for
for the last round of comments or questions. I think there is a lot of things that can be challenged here, but I cannot do it <laughs> because I am the moderator. But I think maybe some in the public who have experience also in the slum and work on the slum. Yes? Well, my name's John, I'm obviously not from here. Um, I'm an Australian Catholic priest who's been on mission here 16 years working with Caritas on migrants and refugees. I feel nearly a need to react to say the children I know that work in this country aren't Thais, they are Burmese, Laos, and uh, Cambodians. And a lot of them are the sex workers, so that's where they come from, I think. As a priest, I would say on mission, um, I gather, I pick up what you're saying, I agree, actually. The real mission in church that I understand, that what we're about is reverse mission. It's not what I give to somebody else, it's what they give to me and how they enrich me. It's 50 years since... to the picture and I hear the word infantilize and I think that's a huge social phenomenon in this country and another factor I didn't pick up on is and I think it's a huge factor cultural I've never lived in a country where culture plays ultimately the big part they're ruled by culture and so I wonder where culture fits into that I'll stay focused and shut up okay. Someone else before the microphone is there. That one, any comment? Maybe you can ask. <laughs> There are no problems, they are not abused, they are not, uh, they are only exploited by the Catholic organization, on which I, I may agree on that part. But, <laughs> but I am joking here. But what I mean is, you could arrive at a the conclusion, then there is nothing wrong. Then let's leave them uh, in the slum as they are. After all, there is, and this argument is not only in the slum. It has been done on many occasions uh, during colonial time, after colonial time, for poverty in rural villages. That, after all, they are so smiley, and I mean, when they look, especially for Southeast Asia, it's a little bit diff different the image that has been for Africa and other parts of the world. But from this part of the world, it has often. Uh, been the impression that there is nothing wrong with poverty. Because after all, children, peasants, rural people, they look quite okay if you go to visit a village in Laos or in Indonesia. After all, yeah, everything is fine. You don't see anything wrong with the class structure or the ethnic structure or many other structures. So i like to have your reaction about whether something should be done, should be done differently, should be done by them themselves, not necessarily by outsiders, or is already a situation that is fine in itself, actually for both of you. Um, I'll, try, I'll attempt to answer this question and um, in the best way possible that I know how. Um, I think that, I think I'm not the right person to answer this question in a way, because I do feel like 
the person who should be answering these questions are the kids themselves. Um, I think this is um, part of the reason why um, when I was interviewing them for the re for review for this book, I asked the question of, do you have anyone, has any, oh, sorry, has any outsiders or people coming into the slums offering help, has any of that help actually been actually helpful? And from what they said, like, um, I think I said that, uh, said in my commentary that most of them would, um, most of them gave examples of activities that empower them or support them or give them like self-belief and self-esteem. And I do think from what I experienced from knowing them, those are the things that they actually want and need. But I do think I'm not the best person to answer this question, that it has to be them to. I think that's one of the reasons why um, there's been a bigger movement from children themselves to give themselves a voice. Um, a couple of months ago, oh no, actually, a couple of, um, maybe two, two years ago, I did um, write another piece on how hip-hop is being used by um, the younger Thai generation, and especially from kids in the slum, to um, express their pride in where they come from, or to actually like tell their own stories. And I do think with the internet, and with um, mostly with the internet, there's a lot more um, desire by the kids to actually um, make their own voices heard. So I do feel like that's the most important thing, that we find the best way to actually shine a light on what they actually want to say. I do agree with him, and uh, my book actually, uh, the second part of my book is devoted to children's voices. So I really try to let the children talk about this. But to be clear, Rosalia, uh, I don't say that everything is good. Quite the contrary is that. But what they do not do is to pathologize poverty. As victims. And if you highlight their suffering as linked to bad family structures. It's the result of bad parenting, it's the result of uh, drugs abuse uh, among adults, it's the result of which are the normative uh, discourses that are used to describe these cases, right? Young children are victims, the families are broken, a lot of problems at home, etc. If you describe things this way, you actually Fewer, the very economic and political processes that are producing a suffering in the very first place. So what they do is to highlight the political and economic macrostructures that break families, that force uh, families to live that way in Islamic communities. It's not their bad intrinsic nature it's not that they are primitive. It's not that because of their ethnic origins, they are less uh, moral and Thai than upper middle class families are. But it's because of the political, economic, structural violence they are exposed to that these situations happen in there. So this is actually something that I try to apply very much in the book. And I think that in order for this to be a light property, we are first to deconstruct the
know what the perception of Islam is, so they would avoid saying they're from that, so as not, so they would not be stereotyped. Um, one of the kids actually said that once he revealed that he was from the slums, he lost some friends because those friends had percep a perception of what he would be, he was like, based on previous images or portrayals. So that's what. So I think that it's very important what you said about deconstructing that victim, like victimized like image, in order, in order to like empower that empower them. As I didn't, I didn't uh, reply properly to John. Culture. Well, this book is about the cultural politics of childhood, and I think that this book does something important in the literature of Thai studies, which is um, beyond the particular situation of these children. Now, normally, uh, scholars uh, of Thailand would look at Thailand through the lens of parenthood, monarchic parenthood, military parenthood, state parenthood, right? Because monarchy, military, and state are the main, uh, let's say, structural dimensions through which Thailand is constructed, even in uh, academic scholarship. What I try to do is to invert this focus and to look at Thailand not through the lens of parent pump and paw, right? But through the lens of childhood pump and day, pump and low. Because I think that for too long time, pump and paw, fatherhood has shaped all the discourses about this country. And it's time, scientifically, ethically, politically, to look at children's perspective, at, at young people's perspective, and to invert the paradigm by placing childhood at the top of the pyramid. Thank you. We have a lot of microphone, but I don't know why they're always missing. Okay, so I think we are. I think there is a lot of. I just wanted to provoke uh, some discussion, of course, for the sake of of debate. Uh, but I think are important questions, and indeed uh, the whole issue, which didn't come up so strongly, but probably is there, is exactly what is the view of the children themselves. Yeah. Uh, We like to buy the book and read it carefully, and of course, uh, Giuseppe is here for signing uh, the book. And uh, I am sure that there is much more than what we have been able to uh, examine uh, today in this very short time. Thank you, Pim, uh, for the very important comments that. As you know, but we count on uh, people's support. Uh, we are very democratic in this, so we want to have a movement of people that address this very important issue. We do not charge, but we, are, we can indeed uh, contribute to this endeavor. Uh, the next event of Junction is again about Myanmar, is the B weekly update on the 5th of uh, January. Uh, we have done this since the beginning of the coup. So we have, this is the 18th uh, B-Weekly with some weeks in between. B-Weekly update, so please tune in for that. That is not on site. And later in January we will also have an exhibition on art 
uh, from Myanmar again that basically show from the beginning of the coup up to one year of the coup through art work and collaborating with FCCT, uh, our exhibition on women uh, in the democracy movement in Myanmar will be at FCCT starting on the 24th of uh, January with uh, fundraising. <laughs> we are part of the <laughs> fundraising award, uh, our fundraising night with food, music, and of course the image of FCCT. But the funds are not for us, it's actually for the uh, Myanmar Fund of FCCT for journalists of uh, Myanmar. So with this, I wish you uh, best for a better, hopefully, years, and hopefully they are not going to close us again in 2023. So good luck with everything, and see you in the new year. Bye. Thanks again.